thanks for agreeing to be part of State Street's leadership series on in how institutional capital is addressing climate change risk. Um, I want to start with the COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. and how you think that has affected the urgency around climate change. Has it helped or hurt? Well, uh, Ron, thank you for having me. And uh, of course, it's uh, the pandemic has been a great tragedy. Um, it has, um, in the end, uh, probably helped accelerate uh, efforts around climate change for a couple of reasons. One is that um, clearly it's underscored the importance of resilience. Um, you know, we weren't prepared. None of us were prepared for the pandemic in so many ways. It's, it's much uh, uh, more cost effective to prepare in advance. And we can't self-isolate from climate change. So first, uh, importance of resilience. The second thing is that in terms of thinking about coming back from uh, the, uh, the economic difficulties, challenges of the pandemic, um, and moving forward, building back better in the phrase of the moment, um, there has really been a focus of a number of governments uh, around the world in terms of spending, not just spending, but framing, providing regulation, and helping the financial sector frame uh, a, a, a more sustainable recovery. Um, so you see it in Europe, for example, about a third of the euros uh, committed, whether it's Germany, France, uh, the European Union, the UK, uh, government's measures, all in that direction. But very importantly, and, and going directly to what you're focused on at State Street, is the agenda around private finance is also accelerating. And I think that uh, could be as decisive, in fact, more decisive than any particular measures governments take. Well, speaking of private finance, when you were the chair of the Financial Stability Board, you were one of the early uh, global financial leaders, if you will, to make the connection between financial stability and climate change. And indeed, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD, was really a key inflection point because it actually was the first widely uh, adopted measure to actually bring some transparency to around this. It's provided a framework for incorporated climate change risk, and it's helped investors have the necessary transparency around how companies are managing that risk. How would you describe the progress to date has, uh, in uh, TCFD implementation, and what do you think we need to accelerate more, more widespread adoption? Yeah, well, if, let me let me first uh, also thank you uh, and State Street for their uh, support of the TCFD. You were there early, and I think that's been incredibly important given your breadth and uh, and credibility in these in these areas. Um, what's happened since? And it was only five years ago uh, in the run up to Paris that the TCFD was uh, launched with uh, Mike Bloomberg in the head and the private sector really coming up with these uh, these standards. And then it was delivered to the G20 leaders. Uh, at the German summit, the Hamburg summit, about uh, two years later. So it's, it's really only had a few reporting rounds. Now, where we stand today, we've got 1,500 of the top companies around the world reporting against TCFD. Not all the TCFD standards, to be clear, and, and there's some unevenness there. Um, but what we have is, you know, State Street joined by a huge uh, swath of balance sheet across the global financial system now, $130 trillion plus dollars of balance sheet asking for this disclosure. So when we, as we talk today, the agenda is twofold. The first is to refine the uh, recommendations and make sure that they're applied more broadly, but really shift them from being a private sector initiative, which the private sector has done a great job on this, but now it's time for the public sector to pull it in um, and start to have those pathways to mandatory, whether it's a, a mandatory disclosure along these lines, whether it's, um, through the uh, IFRS disclosure standards, whether it's securities regulator standards um, or uh, indeed uh, some national standards. And for COP26, a year from now, that's what we're looking to do is have those different pathways so that investors, providers of capital can look consistently across uh, geographies um, and sectors and uh, get proper climate disclosure. That's great. That's great to see that progress. You've now got a new role as the UN Special Envoy for Climate and Finance. Um, as you think about this challenge from your new perch, what are the opportunities, what are the risks, what are the challenges, and what are your goals for COP26 next year? Yeah, well, the goal is um, uh, the goal is modest. Uh, Learn from you to have uh, big goals, um, and the goal is to put in place really the framework so that 
investors, um, providers of capital lenders um, can take climate change into account in making those decisions. So just like you take into account credit risk or interest rate risk or future cash flows, the climate and where a, a company or an asset is positioned along the transition towards net zero, you, you, you have what you need. That means reporting what we just discussed on the TCFD. It means for banks and insurance companies um, improving risk management um, around particularly transition risks, the risks that arise as we go from where we are to where we need to get to. Um, and one of the most important things is uh, the third element, which is ways of um, portraying the position of a portfolio relative to the transition. And let me explain, it's, it's, it's not as simple as saying, I have a green portfolio, you know, it's all in renewables. Uh, or I have a brown portfolio, it's everything else. What we wanna be able to show is those shades of green, the transition from where the economy is today across all sectors to where we need to get to in a way that's understandable for clients, for investors. Um, and we're working through that. If I can make one other point, uh, because this is important, is we're also working to develop uh, a true functioning private sector market for nature-based solutions and carbon offsets so that um, as you know, Ron, a number of uh, companies around the world from Microsoft to BP and, and on are setting out net zero strategies. Well, the question is, where do they get the net in net zero and is it reliable? And, you know, as, as market participants, as market structures, we need to provide them with a market they can rely on. And that's, you know, it, it, it done properly. It's a tens of billion dollar a year market. And that's what we're looking to set up by, uh, by COP26. I think that's a terrific initiative. We're also delighted to announce that as of this year, 2020, State Street has become carbon neutral and we continue to reduce our absolute emissions. But the point about a reliable market is actually quite important for all of us that are trying to participate in this. So that's a great initiative. You know, you mentioned Paris, um, 2015, it was five years ago. Um, five years later, uh, what have been the biggest surprises for you, both good and bad? Well, I think the um, probably I'm not entirely surprised, but I think we should hold countries to standards uh, that we hold ourselves. And so it's been a disappointment that um, the NDCs that a number of countries uh, announced have not been implemented to uh, the degree. And I think one of the great things about Paris was um, uh, was the honesty with which um, the various country efforts were added up, uh, you know, you go to a number of these, and I've gone to probably too many of these international meetings, and we say, well, here's an issue, and we're going to do X, and it solves the issue. And of course, X doesn't solve the issue, it moves you towards it. But, you know, uh, with Paris, it was, the issue is we need to get below two degrees, here's what everyone's going to try to do, but it doesn't get us to that, it gets to two eight. And of course, the disappointment is the countries haven't fully come through. Okay, so, but at least we know it and we have the homework mark. I think what has been most encouraging really has been the movement in the private sector and particularly the private financial sector. And, you know, I think we know from experience and it goes to Lynn's work in inclusive capitalism, the work you know, we've done together on various things is that when the private sector has a clear goal, when it has the information and the tools to manage towards that goal, it figures out ways to get there that are not obvious to uh, to the authorities or you know individuals. The innovation is great, and I do really feel that the momentum is getting there. So it's the responsibility of the uh, uh, of uh, you know public uh, public authorities, um, uh, whether it's a central bank or securities regulator or governments, to finish the job on getting the framework in place for the financial sector. So. Quite frankly, investors, uh, lenders, um, insurance companies, others can get on with uh, get on with the job of moving us forward. Lynn, like Mark, you've also been focused on people and planner for many years. You've brought together some of the most influential corporate and investment leaders from around the world to promote a more sustainable and inclusive form of capitalism. Now you're channeling your efforts into a very special initiative that Mark and I and many others uh, are basically joining and following you on. The goal is to get all to commit our organizations to specific actions that address these linkages across environmental, social, racial, and economic inequities and drive real systemic change. And with a very special partner, tell us about the inspiration behind the Council for Inclusive Capitalism and how you describe the shared mission. 
Thanks, Ron. It's great to be with Mark and you. A couple times tonight, we've mentioned the year 2015. Mm -hmm. And 2015 was really a year when you could reasonably think that the globe was going toward inclusivity and sustainability. Um, Pope Francis came out in June with the Laudato Si, where he spoke about needing to listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Then in September of that year, we had the UN adopt the Sustainable Development Goals. And then of course, Mark just told us TCFD was also started in 2015. And by December 2015, we had the Paris Accords. And it was that year after having many years since the financial crisis of working with you and Mark and people, uh, great leaders around the world on the idea of inclusive capitalism and the idea that we need to reform the capital markets so that they create an inclusive and a sustainable and dynamic and trusted economy that it occurred to me there's a concept in politics, which is that, that you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. And there are so many leaders around the world like you who are really doing the right thing for people and for planet. It occurred to me that where, where does the poetry possibly lie? And I felt that it was in having a moral authority. And so I wrote a letter to the person on the planet who I thought had the greatest moral authority of our lifetime, and that's Pope Francis. And I explained to him in this letter the work that we're doing, and that it is a movement toward answering the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor but that unlike the civil rights movement that had a king or a Mandela as a moral leader, we needed a moral leader. And would he give us his moral guidance in how we move to a just transition, as they said in the Paris Accord, to a fair earth? And um, I wrote this letter and asked him to create a council for inclusive capitalism at the Vatican, because I thought it was very important that we be located there. And about a year later, I received a beautiful letter from Cardinal Carolyn that said that the Holy Father agreed. And this council for inclusive capitalism is now housed in the dicastery for Integral Human Development at the Vatican under the immediate guidance of Cardinal Peter Turkson. And our goal is to, first of all, set forth what are the principles of inclusive capitalism. What does capitalism have to be to address the needs of the common good? And we have our principles that were written by all of our guardians. I should say that Mark Carney was a major author along with many of the other guardians um, who I'm very grateful for in writing those principles. And we then had a meeting with the Vatican about those principles. But I would say the most important thing we're doing because we need as Pope Francis actually put in his letter, we need concrete action. And all of us have great ability to do things. And by all of us, I don't mean the amazing CEOs who are members of the council, who are guardians for inclusive capitalism, but I mean every person, how we buy things, how we treat people, the kindness that we exhibit in our life, all of that is part of inclusive capitalism. And the immediate thing that the council will do is first agree the principles for inclusive capitalism. And then each of us are going to be making our commitments to an inclusive 
and sustainable way to conduct our own businesses. And all of this will be public and we are inviting other companies and other people to come on to the, to the inclusivecapitalism.com uh, website of the council and make their own commitments. And all of us are going to come every year and report on how we're doing on our commitments to there are four pillars of commitments. The four pillars are people, planet, principles of government, and prosperity. And that's where we've placed our commitments. Um, so what we're looking forward to is, is first of all, being reaching for goals toward inclusive and sustainable corporate and investing life, but also to realize that we're not always going to meet those goals and that we're going to be forgiving of goals that aren't reached because what matters is the journey, the journey toward a better life for our planet and for our people. Well, listen, I want to thank both of you for being here and, and joining us today.